Amen. Let's have some fun. They asked me which welcome video I wanted to put on, and I said, well, Mike tells me to have fun every time I speak, so we're, we're going to do Mike every single time. If I haven't met you yet, my name's Sean. I'm one of the pastors here. I'd like to wish you a, uh, a happy fake spring. It's going to be like 72 today, right? It's fake spring. There's another winter coming. We're going to get two or three feet of snow in the next two weeks. Hey, I'm not speaking it into existence. I'm just speaking from experience, okay? Don't put your coveralls away quite yet. I wish we could. <laughs> we are going through, great way to start, right? Hey, get ready for the snow. Let's talk about Jesus. <laughs> we are going through a sermon series as, uh, as a teaching team right now called Familiar Story, Fresh Perspective. And what we've been doing is we're taking uh, stories from the Bible that most people know and we're looking at them through kind of a fresh set of eyes, maybe through a perspective that we're not quite used to looking at it from. And so the story that we're gonna be looking at this morning is Jesus feeding the 5,000, and we're gonna be in John chapter six. So if you have your Bibles, either in digital or old school paperback form, why don't you turn with me to John chapter six. If you're joining us at home, or you do not have a Bible, we will have all of the verses available on the screens. A couple of fun facts about John chapter six and about Jesus feeding the 5,000. This is the only one of Jesus' miracles that is present in all four Gospels. The only one. You can find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Also, this is the first miracle that we see where Jesus actually uses his hands. We've seen him do a few miracles before this. The first one was when he turned water into wine at the wedding at Cana. He did that verbally. And then when he healed the invalid man at that uh, pool at Bethsaida, where all of the uh, invalid people are laying around the pool and the, uh, the myth of that era was sometimes an angel would come down and stir the pool and then the first person to come in would get healed. And so Jesus asked this man, do you want to get well? And the man says, well, who's going to help me into the pool? People beat me in, the angel's not here. And Jesus says verbally, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 is the first time that we actually see him use his hands to perform a miracle. Kind of neat. So before we jump into John chapter 6, let's pray. Lord, would you still our hearts? Would you focus our minds? Lord, come and speak to each and every one of us this morning. God, we want to hear your words. We want to hear your voice. Lord, come and have your way. Amen. So John chapter 6, the story starts like this in verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up, and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. The first neat thing that we see here in this text is that Jesus sees the problem before anyone else does. No one has said we're hungry. None of his disciples have said, hey, there's like, there's like thousands of people out there that we're gonna have to feed. Can we like make sure we have some kind of contingency plan ready? Jesus saw the problem before anybody else. And going hand in hand with that is that Jesus also had the solution before anybody else. He was not gonna be surprised by anything that happened that day. And sometimes we forget that that's true of us too. Jesus is not surprised by our problems, and Jesus is not caught off guard looking for a solution. He is always a step ahead, if not more. He sees the problem before we do, and he has the solution before we even try to think one up. We don't ever have to hope that Jesus will somehow figure it out, because he already has. So he asks, Philip, he says, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Verse seven, Philip answers him. It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? 
Barley loaves in that time was basically, to be blunt, it was food for poor people. It was something that you could make quickly and easily that was not gonna cost you a whole lot of money. And the two small fish that this boy had are traditionally accepted as being like mackerels or sardines. Kid's not eating salmon, all right? He is eating the cheapest bread that his family can produce and the smallest, cheapest fish that probably his father, likely a fisherman, could have caught. He's not having a banquet. He is this kid who's essentially on a picnic and has packed the one meal that he may eat for the entire day, and he's got it there in his knapsack. And so Jesus tests his disciples. He says, hey, Philip, where are we gonna find the money to feed all these people? And Philip immediately starts looking at his earthly resources. He says, well, Jesus, it would take us like six months for every person here to have a bite, and it still wouldn't be enough. We need more money. Philip looks at all of his earthly resources and says, well, Jesus, son of the living God, performer of miracles, glad you're here, we need more money, right? Strike one. Philip misses the point. And so then Andrew chimes in. It's funny because Andrew spoke up. We don't even know if Andrew was invited to speak, but being Simon Peter's brother, if you know anything about Peter, Andrew's probably a lot like him and just speaks up. Oh, but there's this boy here. He has, he has five small loaves and, 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 and two fish. And then he says the word full of doubt. He says, he has those things, but, but, how far is that among so many? Man, Andrew almost had it. He was so close. Jesus, performer of miracles, this small boy has five barley loaves and two small fish, and I have faith that in your hands anything is possible. Right? That's what we wish he would have said. But he said, but, but among all of this need, how far could this resource possibly, possibly go? And as we learn in this story, it can go pretty far. So Jesus said in verse 10, have the people sit down. It's nice that he gave the disciples something to do after they struck out, right? I'm like, why don't you guys tell all these people to just, like, sit? <laughs> Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. So with this familiar story, the fresh perspective that I am really excited to talk about this morning is the perspective of that little boy. Someone who's not even mentioned by name. He's almost mentioned in passing. We know that there were 5,000 men there, but the presence of this little boy tells us that there was like 5,000 families. There was husbands and wives, and if there's children there, there were families there. The... Uh, the, the, I think the max occupancy for the Pepsi Center or whatever it's called this week is like 20,000 people. It's easy to say that there's probably 20,000 people in the story, 5,000 men and their families, and families were pretty big. Imagine the Pepsi Center filled with people, and we get to see Jesus do something great. Specifically, not just the eyes of this child, but I want to talk this morning about what it means to have a posture of openness with God. Specifically, God, my hands are open before you. As an offering, whether I'm holding five small barley loaves and two fish, or anything else for that matter, what does it mean to have open hands before God? These two disciples that were mentioned, Philip and Andrew, they struck out, right? Bless their hearts, they struck out. And so God gave them something to do. Jesus said, go, go and have all these people sit down. But the boy got to remain with Jesus, right? The boy got to stay right in Jesus' proximity. And it says in verse 11 that Jesus took the loaves. Now, does that mean that Jesus went, give me those, I'm taking those loaves? <laughs> give me that. No, it, it, it would be better translated as Jesus received those loaves. Jesus accepted those loaves. Jesus didn't snatch anything out of this kid's hand. 
he received what was an open-handed offering of faith and trust and love. So Jesus opened his hands to receive. This child opened his hands to give. And there was this beautiful exchange that took place. When our hands are open before God, he has free access to our lives. God can't fill a closed hand. But when our hands are open before him, he has the privilege and the freedom to place things inside of them and to take things away from them. It's this free, open exchange. When I was uh, in my early 20s, I did youth ministry for a number of years, and I, I love talking about this concept with my students, about, you know, a lot of them were getting ready to enter this transitional period of their lives. They were either going from middle school to high school or high school to college or, or work, and I used to love telling them, are you, are you opening your options to God? Have you really given your plans to him? Like this, like, Lord, I'm 18. You can have whatever you want with at least the next four years of my life. I used to love talking about it. And one of the illustrations that I would do is I would ask somebody, one of my students, does anyone have a $5 bill? And so some kid would raise his hand and I would say, great. Now I want you to understand that I care about you and I have your best interests in mind and I want you to give me that $5 with the understanding that I will never give it back to you. That's gonna be mine. It's gonna go in my pocket and I'm gonna take it home at the end of the day, and you will not get that $5 back. And usually one of the braver kids who knew that I was up, up to something would come up and say, all right, here you go. And I'd say, cool, thank you. Put it in my pocket, he'd sit back down, and I'd finish with whatever my message was. And I could see him get visibly more uncomfortable as the time went by. Because like, you know, $5 in the life of a middle schooler in 2005, was, that, that's a lot of money, right? And he's getting more and more uncomfortable, and more and more uncomfortable. And I'm talking about the importance of trusting God with open hands. And so at, at the end of my message, I would always call him back up and I'd give him 10 bucks, right? I fulfilled my promise that I was not gonna give him back his $5. Now, am I preaching some sort of financial success, prosperity gospel this morning? No, I'm not. I am not doing that. But I'm talking about the trust and the freedom to offer something up to God knowing that he has our best interests in mind. Now, on the other side of that coin of having open hands is what happens when we close our hands off from God. Now, first of all, God cannot bless us. He cannot place things into our hands when we are clutching them against our chest and saying, Lord, no. Lord, you can't have it. Don't touch it. Stay away from me. God cannot bless a closed hand. On the other hand, if there's something in our hands that maybe we want to keep, like a green Sharpie, if there's something in our hands and I am clutching onto it with everything I have and the Lord wants to take it away, he's still gonna win, right? The thing that's different is that when this is gone, I'm gonna have some sore and broken fingers. So what's better? If I clutch onto the things that I hold dearest like this or to hold it out like this? To say, God, I trust you and you can have it. Like Job said in the Old Testament, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Regardless, may the name of the Lord be praised. So, how do you know if you're holding on to something with closed hands before God? It's pretty simple. If something came to your mind in the last two minutes, that might be it. If it's something that's made you uncomfortable in the last two minutes, that might be it. What are the things in your life that you are afraid or nervous or apprehensive to give God total access to? What are the things that you don't even ask him about because you're afraid of what he's gonna say? You're afraid he might say, can I have your fish? We all have it. We all have it. So let's see what happens in the rest of the story. In verse 12, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over. 
by those who had eaten. I love that. Let nothing be wasted. This little boy gave an offering to God, and God performed a miracle with it. And even then, nothing was wasted. Nothing that we give to God is ever wasted. The Bible says that God's word never returns void. Twelve basketfuls of leftovers from this miracle because God doesn't waste anything in our lives. He doesn't waste our successes. He doesn't waste our failures. He doesn't waste our joy. He doesn't waste our pain. Let nothing be wasted. Now, we've seen God provide food for people in the Bible before. Right? If you go all the way back to the book of Exodus, the nation of Israel was wandering around in the desert for years and years and years, and they were concerned that they didn't have any food. So God said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create this stuff called manna, and every morning, like dew on the ground, it's going to come up from the earth, and you're going to collect enough manna to last you for that day. And even to honor the Sabbath on the sixth day, I'm going to let you collect a double portion. I am going to provide this through no effort of yours. I will sustain you while you are in the wilderness. That is what God did for the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. It didn't take a lot of effort for them to eat back then because God provided it up out of the earth. But when I talk about living with open hands before God, it's, it's not a passive obedience like that where you wander out of your tent, grab your manna, and go about your day. It's a little more radical. To use that same illustration of the nation of Israel, it's a lot like crossing the Jordan River. It's where God says, I want you to cross this river. And by the way, there's no bridge. There's no boat. You've got a million people in your tribe, and I want you to step into the river. And if you read that story, we know that the water doesn't stop flowing until the first priest actually steps in. That's the kind of active, radical faith that it takes to give the nearest and dearest things of our heart to God and say, I trust you with this. I trust you with this. Radical obedience always precedes God's radical provision. I'm going to say that again because I think it's kind of important. Radical obedience always precedes God's radical provision. And let's see how this story ends. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who came into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. The person who was blessed most out of all those 5,000 families was that little boy because he got to take his meager offering Sometimes we think that our giftings or our talents or the things that we're going to offer to God are kind of meager. What could God possibly do with what I have? What could God possibly do with who I am? And this little boy took a lunch made for a poor kid and gave it to God, and he got to see the Lord give thanks and break it and bless and bless and bless and bless. Thousands and thousands of people were fed in this miracle because of just a little obedience by a little kid who wanted to give Jesus everything he had, even though in his eyes it probably wasn't much. God loves using little people to do big things. It's fun to look through Scripture and see that. We see Mary, the mother of Jesus, was 14 years old when the angel visited her and said, you're going to bring forth the Messiah. And she said, let it be to me as you, have, as you have said. Gideon in the Old Testament, Gideon was hiding in a wine press. He was the smallest tribe in the whole nation and the smallest among his tribe. And God said, you're going to be the one. He loves choosing small people to do big things because you cannot channel God's power until you first acknowledge your own powerlessness. If we choose to operate on what we think is our own talents, our own gifts, our own abilities, God is happy to sit back and watch us do it. But he will always be there to say, you want to see what I can do with your lunch? You want to see what I can do with that? If you want to keep going on your own, that's fine. But I'd like to do something big. God is always willing to 
use small people to do great things. I think the most common issue that we have when it comes to, to having that, that, that open hand mentality before God is that we are so quick to try and take it back. Right? We finally step out in faith and we say, God, you know what? I'm going to trust you in this. I'm going to trust you with fill in the blank. Okay, you can have it. Nothing's happening. It's been five whole minutes. And I'm not seeing miracles take place. And so we have this temptation to be like, well, maybe, maybe just... Maybe you just need some help. Maybe just, you know, I know I gave it to God and I trust him and all that wonderful stuff, but may, just maybe, maybe I just need to give it a little nudge. Maybe I just, God needs my help, you know, because I'm so great. The problem that we get into is we try to take that back. There's a guy in the Old Testament by the name of Abraham who made the mistake of trusting God with something and then trying to nudge God's plan. We first meet Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 where God calls him. He says, Abraham, I want you to get up and I want you to go. I have a place set aside for you, and I want you to go there. So Abraham, in faith, he gets up and immediately goes to where God has called him to be. And then God shows up a few chapters later in chapter 15, and he says, Abraham, I am going to make you the father of many nations. Your offspring are going to be like the sand on the seashore, the stars in the sky. Even though you and your wife Sarah are so old, I have a plan for you. I am going to make you the father of nations. And it took Abraham one chapter to try and nudge God. After one chapter, Abraham goes, you know what, I don't think God's moving. He's kind of dragging his feet on this, so I think he needs me to nudge his plan a little bit. I know I offered this to him with these open hands, but I just, I just need to go and just change this one thing here. So in the hopes of being that father of nations, the father of offspring like sand on the seashore and stars in the sky, Abraham sleeps with his maidservant. And he says, well, this must be the lineage that God has. This has to be it. I mean, forget the fact that God said it was going to be my wife. God needs a little nudge here. And so Abraham has a son with his maidservant named Ishmael. And it's still chapters and chapters go by. That happens in chapter 16, and it takes until Genesis 21 before God shows up to fulfill his promise. Five chapters, God shows up and blesses Abraham and Sarah with their son, Isaac. If you do the math, it was 25 years from when God made that promise to when God fulfilled it. God still fulfilled his promise. But when we try to nudge God's plan, we get Ishmael's instead of Isaac's. Hear me, church. When we think God needs a little help and we nudge his plan, we get Ishmael's instead of Isaac's. Man, if you know anything about the history of Isaac and Ishmael, Ishmael is basically, you can trace him back to being the father, the father of modern-day Islam. And so you look at all the conflict between Israel and Islam over thousands and thousands of years it came because Abraham decided to nudge God, decided that God's promise and God's plan needed a little help. Man, when we, when we try to nudge God's plan, we get Ishmael's instead of Isaac's, and then we have to deal with the fallout. We get the fruit of our broken efforts instead of the fulfillment of God's beautiful promise. Worship team, why don't you guys come on back up as we wrap it up. So I want to close with this. There's, there's another verse that I want to talk about, just very briefly, about what does it mean to live constantly like this, where we are just letting God, Lord, you can have this, and I'm scared, and I'm nervous, but you can have it. And it comes along the lines of being what, what the Apostle Paul calls a living sacrifice. And he says this in Romans 12, chapter 1. Paul says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. You know what the trickiest part is about a living sacrifice? 
It always wants to crawl off the altar. It does. Every day, it's like, Lord, I trust you with this. You can have this. Where are you going? Nope, put that back on there. That is my faith in you for today. And it's like, you know, I, I saw this video on Facebook once of this poor mother trying to change like her quintuplets diapers at the same time on a bed. And it's like worms. They're just everywhere. That's how it feels when we decide, God, I'm going to trust you with this part of my life. And then it just starts to wiggle. No, you need to stay here. You need to stay here. You need to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And sometimes that is day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment. A living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And Paul even says this, this is your true and proper worship. To go back every day and say, God, in the small things, in the big things, in the easy things, in the hard things, you can have it because I trust you because I want things that come from your hands and not my own. Because I trust that if you're gonna take something away, man, maybe you have a reason. And maybe I won't even know that reason until we're face to face. Matthew says this in chapter 18. Jesus says, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus loved little kids. They were always running up to him in the Bible. How cool is that? Unless you have faith like these little children, we're not gonna see God's kingdom break out on the earth. Man, it's a challenge and it's hard, but I pray that we could see God moving in our lives the way he moved through that little boy and that we get to stand there and see him take our meager offering and bless the multitudes with it. Amen? Amen. Can we stand together? So we're gonna spend some time in worship. We're gonna close a little bit. And I say it every time I'm up here, worship is always a response. It is never something that we have to initiate. It is a response to what God has done, to who God is, to who he says he will always be. He will always be one worthy of us lifting up our lives, our gifts, everything we have and say, God, I trust you and I love you. So let's spend some time telling God how great he is.